All right, hello there, quantum friends. Good to see you again. I appreciate your enthusiasm. And actually, although this is a quantum course, last lecture was kind of on the classical side. We'll continue in that vein for a little while because there are elements of the classical theory of computation that we want to lay down so we can build on them as we erect and study the quantum model of computation. So let's get going. Yeah, last time we talked about the classical circuit model of computing. We talked about Boolean functions, decision problems. We considered the idea of universal gates and the notion of uniform circuit families for the purpose of classifying the computational hardness of a language in the circuit model. We talked about the complexity classes, P and P and Cohen P. We explained the notion of a reduction and the related notion of NP completeness. And today we will continue for a while to talk about classical computing. I wanna introduce the model of randomized computation and reversible classical computation. And then we'll be all set to start talking about quantum computing and we will segue into that by the end of this lecture. Uh, we're already almost halfway through the course, so we're all eager to talk about quantum computing, and that will be the focus uh, from now on for the remaining lectures starting at the end of this one. So let's talk about randomized computation. Last time we, talk about, we talked about circuits that compute Boolean functions. And in randomized computation, I'm going to imagine my computer has access to random numbers. There's a random number generator that can be consulted. So in each step of the computation, we can choose from among more than one possible gate that we could apply. We flip some coins and we decide to apply gate A or gate B or some uh, larger set of possible gates governed by some distribution that we sample from. And so if we perform a whole circuit in that way, we're really taking a sample from many possible computational paths, many possible circuits uh, that we could have been realized and we sample one in each run of the computation. That means even for a fixed input, we're not going to get the same answer every time. Um, nevertheless, the randomized model can be useful if it gives the right answer most of the time. If with um, some probability greater than one half, I get the right answer. And in fact, a probability greater than one half by some non-zero constant that doesn't depend on the size of the input, then although in a given run, I might be so, not be so confident that I'm getting the right answer, to our, the evaluation of some Boolean function or the solution to some decision problem, I can run multiple times and take a majority vote on the outcomes to decide whether the answer is yes or no. And if I run a sufficient number of times, it will be unlikely that the majority of the times I got the wrong answer. So we can amplify the probability of getting the right answer to something very close to one without having to run a very large number of times. So let's see a little more quantitatively how that goes. So we're going to suppose that when we run a circuit in the randomized model, we're going to get the right answer with a probability one half plus delta. Delta is some positive constant. And now we're going to run n trials of the computation. Um, and each time we're going to get a one bit outcome as when we evaluate a Boolean circuit. Um, so there are two to the n possible sequences of outcomes that we could get. 
the outcome is a bit, zero or one. We get a zero or one and times, there are two to the n possibilities. And then if we take a majority vote, the majority vote is gonna give us the wrong answer only if we got the wrong answer the majority of the time, at least n over two times. Um, so let's ask, what is the probability of getting the wrong answer altogether n sub w times n sub w uh, w4 wrong in n runs? So getting the wrong answer is something that occurs with probability less than one half, namely one half minus delta. And that's going to occur n sub w times, if we got the wrong answer, n sub w times. And the probability of getting the right answer is one half plus delta. So if there were a total number of capital N trials, then n minus n sub w is the number of times that we um, got the right answer. So I'm considering one particular sequence where I get a zero or a one uh, each time. And uh, I can assign a probability to that particular sequence um, the way I said here. In each uh, case where I got the wrong answer, it occurred with probability one half minus delta. When I got the right answer, it occurred with probability one half plus delta. But to get the majority wrong, I had to have the wrong answer at least n over two times. So for any nw which is at least n over two, I can bound this probability of the particular sequence of outcomes by one half minus delta to the n over two, one half plus delta to the n over two, okay? Because the most likely possibility is that I just barely had a majority wrong answers and to have even more wrong answers when a wrong answer occurs with probability less than one half is uh, less likely than having exactly half of the answers be wrong. One half minus delta times a uh, one half plus delta is just a uh, one quarter minus delta squared. So if I take out that four and I raise it to the power n over two, that gives me a factor of one over two to the n in front. And then the one minus delta squared gets raised to the n over two power. And I can observe that one minus x uh, can be bounded above by uh, e to the minus x. And so I can uh, bound this by one over two to the n e to the minus four delta squared, and that all gets raised to the n over two power. And that's the probability um, for a particular sequence of getting a sequence of answers in which the wrong answer came up the majority of the time, or at least half the time. The total number of possible sequences is two to the n. So to get the total probability of getting the wrong answer, I can just multiply this by two to the n. I'm using the, the union bound for probability. And that means the total probability of getting the wrong answer, the one over two to the n gets canceled by the two to the n possible sequences. It's just this expression, e to the minus two capital N delta squared. So the great thing is that as N increases, that drops like a bomb. It's exponential in, um, in n. And so that in fact, if I will be willing to tolerate a probability of error epsilon in the majority vote, then it will be good enough to run the computation a number of times capital N such that N is at least one over two delta squared times the log of one over epsilon. That's what it takes. That's the value of capital N that I need for this probability of having the wrong majority to be less than or equal to epsilon. But remember we said that delta is a constant independent of the input size. So the number of times I have to run to uh, once a delta has some fixed uh, non-zero value, the number of times I have to run to get my acceptably small error probability epsilon has nothing to do with the size of the input. It only has to do with uh, delta and epsilon, the probability I'm willing to accept 
and the probability of being wrong in each run. And furthermore, uh, it goes logarithmically, logarithmically in one over epsilon. So that's pretty good. I can make epsilon really small with a modest number of trials. So this is called the Chernoff bound on the probability. And one way of thinking about it is you know that, uh, you know, if I flip a biased coin many times, the probability of uh, getting a certain fraction heads or tails can be well approximated by a Gaussian. And that Gaussian becomes narrower and narrower as I increase the number of trials. And uh, eventually it becomes so narrow that having the majority wrong is way off on the tail of the Gaussian. There's very little probability weight on that tail. So the probability of having the majority wrong if we have a sufficient number of trials gets small very quickly. So I don't really care very much from the point of view of the scaling of the complexity of getting the right answer. If I have some randomized circuit with some specified size, let's say polynomial in the input size, then I just have to run if, uh, as long as delta is a, a non-zero constant, some uh, constant number of times to get a very small probability of being wrong. And delta can be any uh, positive constant for that purpose. Uh, it only affects the prefactor of the polynomial, how many times I have to run, that it'll be the circuit size times some constant that depends on delta. And so since delta doesn't really matter very much, we often by convention say that our goal is to achieve a delta of one sixth. That means a probability of getting the right answer, which is at least two thirds, a probability of getting the wrong answer, which is no larger than one third. So, uh, with that in mind, uh, we'll sometimes say that a randomized uniform circuit family decides a language if for X in the language, the probability of acceptance is not going to be one now because it's a randomized model, but if it's greater than or equal to two thirds for any X in the language, we're happy. As long as we can't uh, fool the circuit family, the probability of when X is not in the language of acceptance will be less than or equal to one third. And then we'll be able to amplify our success probability to uh, whatever level we, file, we find uh, acceptable. And so now we can define a model which is analogous to, or I should say we can define a complexity class, which is the analog of P. P is the polynomial time class in the case of deterministic circuits, which compute functions. Uh, here we're talking about randomized circuits, which sample from a distribution of outcomes. But the analog of P is called BPP. It stands for bounded error, probabilistic, polynomial time. And it means the languages that can be decided by polynomial size, uniform, randomized, circuit families. Now it's clear that BPP, what we can do with randomized circuits, what we can solve efficiently if we have access to a random number generator contains P. We always have the option of not consulting the randomness at all, not using that random number generator that corresponds to deterministic computation. It is encompassed by BPP. Um, and uh, whether BPP is equal to P is actually an open question. It's generally believed on the basis of uh, evidence I'm not going to go into that in fact, BPP is equal to P. Having access to randomness does not allow us to solve efficiently problems that we couldn't solve efficiently without access to randomness, but that's never been proved. Now, just as in the case of P, where we noted there was a larger class or potentially larger class, very, very likely larger class called NP, those are the problems that we could uh, verify the solution efficiently if someone was kind enough to give us a suitable witness or a certificate. Um, and uh, there's an analog of that for randomized computation. It's called Merlin Arthur, the computation class is called Merlin Arthur. That means that you can efficiently check the answer with a randomized computation. 
the name comes from the Arthurian legend in which uh, Arthur was mentored by the powerful magician Merlin. So we imagine that the all-powerful Merlin provides the witness, provides the proof uh, that Arthur, although a mere mortal, is able to efficiently check, uh, which uh, allows him to verify that X is in the language. But he needed Merlin's help. Um, but with Merlin's help, he was able to do the verification efficiently. So it's the same story as P and NP, except now for randomized computation, we call the classes BPP and MA. So uh, just to say that in parallel to the way we said it when we talked about NP last time, we say that a language is in MA, Merlin Arthur, if and only if there's a randomized verifier. The randomized verifier is a uniform circuit family that it uh, takes as input both uh, X where, and where we're trying to determine whether X is in the language and the witness Y. And this randomized verifier is supposed to have the property that when X is in the language, then there is some witness that Merlin can provide for us such that when we have the witness, the probability of acceptance of X and the witness Y is at least two thirds. And if X is not in the language, Merlin can't fool us. There isn't any witness that Merlin could give us such that the randomized verifier would accept with probability less than one third when X is not in the language. Okay, so it's clear, just as was the case for P and NP, that MA contains BPP. Remember, NP contains P because in the case of P, we, Arthur doesn't need Merlin's help at all. Uh, if you want to uh, use the, Mer, uh, the Merlin-Arthur uh, analogy in the case of deterministic computation, uh, we don't need the witness. We can just do the computation ourselves to see whether X is in the language. And that's a special case of the scenario in which a witness is provided. Same thing here. Um, if um, a problem is in BPP, we don't need help from Merlin. We don't need the witness. We can just do the randomized computation ourselves to, um, to see whether X is in the language or not. And furthermore, just as it's clear that BPP contains P, because P is the special case where we don't consult the randomness at all, uh, so it is that MA contains NP because NP is just the special case of MA in which the witness is deterministic, in which the verifier doesn't need to consult the randomness at all. Now I'd like to talk about another model of classical computation, which will be helpful as a step towards the quantum model of computation that we're leading up to, but it's also interesting in its own right, as we'll discuss. Uh, to introduce it, I'd like to um, point out an important physics principle, which is called Landauer's principle. And it can be stated this way. It's named after Rolf Landauer, who formulated it in the 1960s that if we want to erase a bit at some non-zero temperature T, we have to do work. Quantitatively, the amount of work that we need to do to erase one bit is Boltzmann's constant K times the temperature times the log of two. Uh, the base of the logarithm depends on our convention for um, defining, uh, well, it doesn't matter. Let's just say it's log two. Um, and um, so why is this so? Well, I'll give you a example of a memory where we can see in rather physical terms that uh, we, need, we do need to do work to achieve erasure. And I will assert that this principle is much more general and gives a hand-waving argument in 
support of that contention. So let's think about our memory this way. We wanna store one bit in a memory, okay? So we wanna have a state, we wanna have a system with two states, okay? And we want to be able to put the system in either one of the two states to um, distinguish the two possible values of the bit. And so I'm gonna take just one molecule. Uh, you can think of this as a gas, but it's a very minimal gas. It just has one particle, which is inside the box, but there's a partition in the box. And I can put the molecule either on the right side or the left side of the partition. And when it's on the right side of the partition, as it is here, then we say we've stored the value zero in the memory. And when it's on the left side of the partition, as it is here, then we've stored the value one in the memory. So now what does it mean to erase? What it means to erase is that I need to come along and carry out some process, which no matter whether the initial stored value of the bit is zero or one, will map the bit to a fixed value, to some standard value, let's say zero. Let's say the goal of erasure is to take the memory, whether it stores a zero or a one, and map that to zero. Now, this process should not make use of any information about the value of the stored bit. I don't want a process that erases one way when the bit is one and erases another way when the bit is zero. Why don't I want that? Well, because if I were to carry out that procedure, I would need to know whether the bit is zero or one. And that knowledge would have to be recorded somewhere. So I would leave a record behind of whether it was zero or one, and that would mean I hadn't really accomplished the task, right? I mean, if I look at the memory and I see it's zero, and then I mark that it's a zero, or I see that it's a one, so I mark that it's a one, and then I apply procedure zero in the case where the bit is zero and procedure one in the case where the bit is one, then, well, look, I've left behind the mark that indicated which procedure to carry out. So that's no good. I need a way of mapping the bit to zero without knowledge of whether it's a zero or a one to begin with. So here's a way we could imagine doing that. So we have this one molecule gas in the box with a partition, it's either on the left or the right. The first thing we do is we remove the partition. And now the molecule is able to bounce around, occupy either the right side or the left side of the box. Uh, but now I turn the wall on the left of the box into a movable piston and I carefully compress the gas, pushing the partition back to the middle. Um, and uh, now that I know for sure the molecule is on the right side, and then I lock the partition in place there, and I put the cover on the box again. And now, although I don't know for sure whether the bit was zero or one to begin with, after this process is carried out, I do know for sure that the bit has been mapped to zero. But here's the thing, that isothermal compression of the gas is going to cost some work. There's a thermodynamic reason for that, the first law of thermodynamics. It says that the work I need to do to reduce the entropy in an isothermal process where the molecule stays in equilibrium with a surrounding environment, which is at temperature T, is at least in a reversible process, the temperature times the change in the entropy. And it would be even more work if the process were irreversible. So what's the change in the entropy? Well, you can think of the entropy as the logarithm of the number of possible microstates of the system, in this case, our one molecule gas. And the one molecule now can either be on the left side or the right side. Um, so to begin with, and at the end, it only is on the right side. So the, no, the amount of phase space available to it, the number of possible states it could be in has been cut in half when the volume of the box uh, goes from two to one in suitable units. So that corresponds to a change in the log of the number of possible states, which is um, log two, a change in the entropy of Boltzmann's constant, K, 
times log two, which means that the work that we have to do is kt log two. Well, that's what Landauer said. So the key point here is that if we're going to erase, we have to somehow compress the phase space, compress the space of possible states that our memory could be in, that the system could be in. And that requires a dissipated process to squeeze down the phase space. According to fundamental thermodynamic principles, it's necessary when that dissipation occurs that there be a flow of heat from the memory to its environment. Where does the energy corresponding to that heat come from? It has to come from work that we do on the system. So in order to have that entropy of K log two flow out of the memory when we compress its space of possible states by a factor of two, we have to do an amount of work which is at least temperature times the change in the entropy or KT log two. So it's really a very general principle. Erasure necessarily has a thermodynamic cost. You need work to erase. You gotta run a battery or something to erase bits. Well, you can also apply this principle of Landauer's to gates in a circuit. Because the gates in a circuit that we discussed last time, like an AND gate or an OR gate, map two input bits to one output bit. That reduces phase space. It reduces the number of possible states that the system can be in. And therefore, Landauer is a princ Landauer's principle applies. It must cost some work to perform the gate because it in effect erases, it compresses the space of possible states. Let's say it's the AND gate, for example. Well, the AND gate takes three possible inputs, 0, 0, 0, 1, and 1, 0, all to the same output 0. And it takes the input 1, 1 to the output 1. So if the output is 1, then we know for sure what the initial state was before the gate. It had to be 1, 1. But if the output is zero, we don't know. There are three possibilities that it could have been, zero, 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 one, or one, zero. And the action of the gate has destroyed that information. The, that information about the initial state has been lost by the execution of the gate. So we say the gate is logically irreversible. You can run it forward, but you can't run it backward because when the output is zero, you can't uh, go back in time and say whether the initial state was 0, 0, 0, 1, or 1, 0. So if we imagine that the possible input bits, the four possibilities, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, and 1, 1, all occurred equal probably, then average over that distribution, the amount of information that will be lost, I can write as 3 quarters times the log of 3. Um, 3 quarters because three quarters of the time with probably three quarters will be in one of the three initial states for which the logically irreversible operation occurs. And log three, because the, uh, there are three possible initial states which got uh, shrunk to just one. And so that means on average that's about, uh, well, it's about 1.2 bits. So Landauer argued that just like erasure, when we do a gate in a computation, there's an unavoidable thermodynamic cost. Somebody's got to pay a power bill when we do a gate because gates are logically irreversible. Now you could ask, is that why uh, I need a battery in my laptop? Is that why I can feel the heat being dissipated when I put my computer on my lap? Well, not really. Um, the numbers don't quite work out. Let's say we're talking about room temperature. Your laptop may run a little hotter than that, but close enough. So at uh, 300K, KT is about four times 10 to the minus 21 joules. And let's say you've got a, a pretty fancy CPU. It's got a few billion transistors and it's got a, Glock, a clock speed of a few uh, gigahertz. Well, even if we imagine that those transistors are uh, switching every clock cycle and uh, all three billion transistors 
are uh, simultaneously in play, which isn't quite true, but it's enough for uh, giving us um, a bound on the number of bit operations. So that would be 3 billion times 3 billion operations in, um, in a second, which is 10 to the 19 bit operations per second. So what would Landauer say? He would say, okay, well then you're going to have to have a power cost or a number, a number of joules per second, which is 10 to the 19 times KT. And uh, that turns out to be about uh, 40 millijoules per second, or in other words, 40 milliwatts of power. And actually your laptop uh, is using more energy than that. Uh, maybe it's running at uh, 100 watts or something like that. So Landauer's thermodynamic cost doesn't really account for all the power that's being dissipated in the CPU uh, in your laptop. In fact, a lot of energy is being wasted. Now heat dissipation really is a constraint on computing technology today. And you have to worry a lot about keeping a CPU cool. You don't want it to melt. If you put together a big parallel computing system like a supercomputer, then you need a lot of cooling uh, to keep things from running too hot. That's uh, certainly the case. There's a lot of thermodynamics involved in state-of-the-art computing, but um, not really because of Landauer's principle, at least not yet. Maybe someday we'll reach this fundamental limitation and uh, we won't be able to reduce the um, the, the power bill further, at least that's what Landauer imagined when he proposed his principle, except he was wrong when he said that computing has a thermodynamic cost necessarily. He was right about erasure. Erasing information really is necessarily logically irreversible. It compresses phase space, and that means it costs energy. It takes work to erase. But computation doesn't have to involve dissipation. It's possible to run a computer reversibly so that you can run the computation forward in time and then keep the full output of all the bits. And then you can run it backward um, because it's really computing a invertible function. Okay. And so I want to uh, convince you that that's the case, that um, it's possible to compute reversibly and therefore evade the thermodynamic cost that Landauer was talking about. Now, just because it's reversible uh, doesn't mean that uh, we can't do a computation. What I want to argue is that a reversible computer would be able to simulate a Boolean circuit efficiently. So the circuit we talked about last time uh, where we had a universal get, gate set of and, or, and uh, not, uh, we'd be able to simulate that even if we had reversible hardware and without much of a price to be paid in the cost of uh, additional gates. So in principle, we really can compute for free. Um, it's erasure that's hard and computing is easy, a little bit counterintuitive because I, uh, forget stuff all the time, and it seems easy to do, whereas cogitating seems like hard work. But at least from a fundamental point of view, it's the erasure that's hard, not the processing of information. So what a reversible computer is doing is it's computing an invertible function. So it's not going to take n bits to one bit like a Boolean circuit does. It's going to take n bits to n bits. It has to be a one-to-one -one function, right? Otherwise it wouldn't be invertible. So there can't be two different values of the input that get mapped to the same output because that would be logically irreversible. If it's one-to-one, -one, that means there are two to the n possible inputs and there must be two to the n possible outputs as well. So really what the invertible computation does taking n bits to n bits, you can think of it as just a permutation of all of the n bit strings. There are two to the n n bit strings, uh, two to the n possible inputs, there are two to the n possible outputs. And what the computation does is it determines for each one of the two to the n possible inputs, which of the two to the n possible outputs it gets mapped to. So if I want to count all of the reversible functions, 
all of the invertible functions from n bits to n bits. It's just a question of counting permutations of length n strings. So those are permutations of two to the n objects, okay? There are a lot of those, two to the n factorial. And if I use Sterling's approximation, I can approximate that pretty well by, I can, you know, uh, m factorial is well approximated by m over e raised to the power m. That's what I'm doing here, except m is two to the n. So with uh, n bits going to n bits, the number of permutations, therefore the number of invertible functions is approximated well by two to the n divided by e raised to the power two to the n. So that's really a lot of invertible functions. But actually it's a tiny fraction of all of the functions, not surprisingly, the invertible ones are rather special. It's a small fraction of all of the functions that take n bits to n bits. Remember we said the number of Boolean functions was two to the two to the n. And if we're taking n bits of input to n bits of output, you can think of that as n Boolean functions. So the number of those is the number of Boolean functions raised to the nth power. And so that's actually two to the n to the two to the n. The number of invertible functions is smaller than that by one over e raised to the power two to the n. And that's a very large power of one over e. So that's what I meant when I said that it's a tiny fraction of all of them, but there's still lots and lots and lots of invertible functions taking n bits to n bits once n uh, is no longer very small. Now it's also clear that if I want to encode a Boolean function, it's possible to do so with a um, invertible function. Here's one way of doing it. Um, there's some function that takes, uh, let's call it f, that takes an n-bit input to a one-bit output. Well, I can consider this invertible function, I call it f tilde here, which has an n plus one bit input. The input consists of x, which is the input to the Boolean function f of x, and then one additional bit which I've called y here. And what f tilde does is it preserves the value of x in that input n bit register. And then it essentially it flips the extra bit, which had the initial value y if f of x is equal to one, and it doesn't flip it if f of x is equal to zero. So I wrote that as the xor of y and f of x. An XOR is just the same thing as addition modulo two, or in other words, if f of x is one, it flips the value of y, and if f of x is zero, it doesn't flip the value of y. Um, and so the information about what f of x does is uh, encoded there. If I set y equal to zero initially, then what f tilde would do is it wouldn't affect the input register at all, but it would print out the value of the Boolean function f of x and the extra output bit, um, the n plus first bit. Okay, so we can ask, are there universal reversible gates? So uh, what does that mean? Well, it means the same thing as in the circuit model we talked about before, except this time for invertible functions. We'd like to know whether there are some simple operations that when composed together, allow us to construct, to build up any invertible function we might be interested in that takes n bits to n bits for any value of n. Well, in fact, there are universal reversible gates in that sense. Uh, but in now, um, the gates with two bits of input won't do, that's not enough. Of course, if they're invertible gates, they take two input bits to two output bits. So I call them two to two uh, bit gates here. And in fact, there are not universal two to two bit gates, which are invertible, which allow me to construct any invertible function. I have to go to a three bit input. There are three bit to three bit um, invertible gates that we can use to 
build circuits that allow us to um, evaluate any invertible function of n bits to n bits. So how do we see two isn't enough? Well, suppose we consider the linear operations of two bits to two bits. That's what I've indicated here. So all of these uh, numbers, x, y, x prime, y prime, a, b, um, they're all binary. So the numbers are either zero or one. And m is a matrix. The addition is understood as modulo two. Um, so there are four possibilities for a, b, uh, which I listed here, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. So what the plus a, b does is depending on the values of a and b, it either uh, you know, flips the or not the first bit and the second bit. And then I want to choose the matrix M so that it too is binary, so that its entry, entries are 1 and 0. So when the matrix M acts on the input bits x and y, uh, it gives me output bits if I evaluate the matrix arithmetic modulo two, which are binary, either zero or one. And if this is going to describe an invertible operation, then M has to be an invertible matrix. And what it means to be invertible here is that it can be inverted by another binary matrix whose entries are zero and one. And in fact, it's not hard to make a list of all of the binary matrices with entries zero and one, which can be inverted by binary matrices. And here's the list. Uh, some of them are familiar ones like the identity and the thing we called uh, poly X before. And there are also these other guys, all of which have a uh, determinant one or minus one and uh, trace either um, either one or uh, two. And anyway, they all have the property that they can be inverted by the matrices from this list. So they're invertible in that sense. And the thing to notice is how many of these there are. These are the linear operations taking two bits to two bits where linear means linear, but with respect not to uh, real numbers or complex numbers, but the finite field uh, Z2, the binary field. Um, I'm doing uh, linear algebra um, on a vector space where um, the vectors are binary strings and we can multiply them either by zero, which of course maps them to zero or by one, which leaves them alone. And th that's the, uh, the vector space I'm talking about. And because it can be expressed in this linear form, this is a, a linear map when we do an addition modulo two. But since we have six, of these matrices M, and we have four choices for the additive term A and B, they're all together six times four, 24 possible linear transformations. And that exhausts all of the invertible two to two gates, right? Because the, um, the number of them is two to the two factorial or a four factorial, and that's 24. So all of the invertible gates are linear in the case where we have two input bits and two output bits, but that won't do. If I wanna do universal computation, and in particular, if I wanted to simulate Boolean circuits, I can't multiply if all I have is linearity. I mean, I can multiply by one, but that doesn't do anything. Um, and uh, I, I can't make an AND gate, I can't make an OR gate. And we need those things for universal computation and we just don't have them if we're stuck with these linear operations. If I want nonlinear operations, I have to go beyond two input bits. And here's one which will do the job. It's called the Toffley gate or sometimes we call it the controlled controlled knot. Um, here's the notation that I'm gonna use for it. Um, and uh, what is controlled controlled knot? mean there are three input bits, x, y, and z can take values either zero or one. And if x is equal to one and y is equal to one, then and only then the value of z flips. But for any other choice of the inputs x and y, nothing happens, okay? But if x and y are both equal to one, 
then the third register flips. And that's what I've indicated here as the XOR or addition modulo two of Z and the product X times Y, which is going to be one if X and Y are both one and zero otherwise. That's what a top of the gate does. And uh, you see, it does have the nonlinearity that we'd like to realize an AND gate because of this multiplication of X times Y. If we're able to fix input bits to be either zero or one, uh, then it's easy to see that I can use this Toffley gate. Toffley, Tom Toffley is a guy. He had got a gate named after him. It's quite a distinction to have a gate named after you. Um, if I fix the input bits appropriately, I can use the Toffley to simulate a not operation or an and operation. Um, if we... Um, set x and y equal to one, then, um, and you know, we just enter constants for x and y, then of course what it does is it applies a knot to the third register. It flips it, okay? It adds one to it. Um, and if I set z initially equal to zero, and then whatever x and y are, after the Toffoli gate x, the product xy will appear in the third register. That's just the same thing as the and of x and y. So if you're willing to accept some junk that you have to discard, this three to three gate simulates the two to one gate, the and gate. If I fix c equals zero, then uh, for any inputs x and y, I can read out in the third register the and of x and y. And then I have this uh, superfluous X and Y sitting around, but I can uh, throw those in the garbage can if I want to. And of course, uh, as you know, if, if I can do a not and I can do an and, that's enough for doing an or just because of this Boolean identity that the or of X and Y is the same thing as taking the not of not X uh, and not Y. So if I can use a Toffoli to get um, an and and a not, then uh, I can simulate all of the gates in the universal set uh, that we talked about last time. Incidentally, another thing that's worth noting is that if I set x equal to one, then the Toffoli gate acting on the uh, second two registers becomes a useful linear operation taking two bits to two bits. It's what we call the controlled not gate or C not gate, which is just an abbreviation for control not. Remember what the Toffoli does is it flips the third bit if X and Y are both equal to one. Well, if I fix X to be equal to one, then of course that means that if Y is equal to one and only then the value of Z is going to flip. So with X equal to one, then this operation on Y and Z is what we call a controlled not or C not gate. Notice in particular that if I set x equal to one and z equal to zero, then what the Toffoli does is that it just copies the value of y in the third register. So y is the input bit in the second register. And when x is equal to one and z is equal to zero, after the Toffoli x, I have y in both the second register and the third register. In other words, that's a copy operation. So, I've explained to you how we can simulate the logically irreversible gates in the gates that we talked about last time using a Toffoli if we can fix input bits. In that sense, the Toffoli is a universal gate. Um, one can say more that if you want to build up any permutation of n bit strings, then just a Toffoli gate is enough if you can fix input bits. And that's discussed in some detail in the lecture notes, but I'm not gonna take the time to go through it in class. I encourage you to read that, but at least I've convinced you that our reversible machine that does only Toffoli gates and can fix constant bits is able to simulate the circuit model that we talked about last time. Now that might not be enough to make Landauer happy because he would say, yeah, but look at what you're doing. Every time you use a Toffoli gate to simulate an AND gate, you're generating junk. 
because you get this X and Y that um, you uh, didn't get rid of. And so unless you have some way of refreshing or erasing bits, you're gonna be stuck with those values of X and Y in your memory. And so every time you do an AND gate, you're going to have to load up your memory with another two uh, bits worth of stored information. And eventually you're gonna run out of memory and you won't be able to go on with the computation unless you erase the memory. Aha, but erasing the memory does have a thermodynamic cost that does require dissipation. So Landauer might say, well, all you've done is you've delayed the thermodynamic power bill that you have to pay for doing all of this computing uh, because eventually you're going to have to erase or else you're going to run out of memory. But actually that's not quite right. Uh, Charlie Bennett, I think, was the first to point this out in the 1980s. Maybe it was the 70s. Yeah, I guess it was the 70s. Um, we don't need to do the erasure because we can do the following thing. We can simulate whatever circuit you're interested in, which uses the gate set and, or, and not, using our Toffoli gates by fixing bits, like I said, and that will indeed start to clog up our memory after a while. But after we finish with the computation, we can then copy the answer. I showed you how we, if we can fix inputs, we can use the Toffoli gate to copy. So I can take the answer bit, make a copy of it, and then I can run the whole computation backwards because it's a reversible computation. I just use the inverses of all the gates and run the circuit in the opposite order. And that will undo all of the computing that we did. And so if I started out with a memory register that was set all to zeros, then it gets all clogged up when I do the computation going forward, but it gets completely unclogged when I do the computation going backward. And at the end, it's set to all zeros again, and I can use that memory again the next time I wanna compute. So we had to pay a little price. We had to run the computation twice, once forward and once backward to avoid the thermodynamic cost of erasure, but that's not such a big deal. We just made the computation twice as long in terms of the number of gates, the gate complexity. And actually you don't really need to make it twice as long. There's a discussion in the chapter five lecture notes of how through a recursive procedure in which you run backwards some routine, uh, subroutines of the computation uh, in the course of doing the full computation, you can reduce the uh, memory requirement. Um, and uh, that's kind of a fun thing, but I'm not gonna go through it in class. So um, it's a nice thing to know that processing information does not in principle carry a thermodynamic cost. And what it means is that the reversible computing model um, has the same computational power as the circuit model we talked about last time because it can simulate it efficiently. Um, and uh, so if we were stuck with only reversible computation, our conclusion about what problems are hard and what problems are easy, the classification of problems we can solve with polynomial size, uniform circuit families, and the ones we can't, well, it would be the same classification, whether we use the reversible model or the um, original circuit model, which has logically irreversible gates. Okay, so now let's talk about the quantum model. I'll just introduce it briefly, and then we'll get into uh, its properties in more details last time. So now we're gonna talk about a computational model which we think really is more powerful than the classical circuit model. Well, we don't really know how to prove that from first principles, but we wouldn't be teaching this course if we didn't believe that quantum computers can do certain things efficiently that we can't do efficiently with classical computers. And that's captured mathematically by saying that there are algorithms that we can run in the quantum model which have circuit sizes that are polynomial, uniform circuit families in the quantum model, which are polynomial size, which can solve problems, um, decide languages that uh, we can't efficiently solve within the classical circuit model. So what are the ingredients 
in the uh, quantum circuit model. Well, I talked about this some uh, already in the first lecture, but let me remind you again. So first of all, there's the arena in which the computation takes place, quite different than in the classical model. We're not processing bit strings anymore. Uh, we are processing vectors in a Hilbert space. Uh, we could consider mixed states, but we don't have to. So we can imagine that we have a pure state in um, a Hilbert space of n qubits, and the computer processes that state. And in the end, it's going to read out an answer, which is classical by making a measurement. So the important thing is that um, there's some notion of decomposing this really, really big Hilbert space in which that state vector lives, which describes the state of our computer into small subsystems, which we usually take to be qubits. So in the classical model, there's a kind of locality assumption there too, because we represent the information in terms of bits and the gates, which we consider to be simple operations, just act on pairs of bits or three bits at a time, something like that. So they're pretty simple to execute in hardware, but in the end, we put them together to build up these very complicated operations that act on many input bits. And um, we have to have a notion like that to talk about complexity. Because if we wanna say some computations are hard and some are easy, well, we have to have in mind that those operations that just act on a couple of bits are the ones that are easy, but when we put them together to do operations on many bits, that can be hard. And we need a similar notion to define complexity in the quantum model. Um, and so it's not enough just to say that there's a Hilbert space, which has dimension two to the n, which is the arena for the computation. We also need some preferred decomposition into small subsystems. That's needed to define the model. And so what's the physics of that? Well, again, it has to do with the fact that we think physics is local in the sense that it's hard to do operations which act collectively on many qubits at once. So qubits are encoded um, in hardware in lots of different possible ways. They could be carried say by single atoms or single electrons or single photons and other more complicated ways as well. We talked about that a little bit in the first lecture. But if you have a system of many atoms, for example, you can encode the qubits in the atoms and it's relatively simple for you to manipulate one atom at a time or two atoms at a time, much more complicated to do some collective operation on many atoms at once. And so that's very important for talking about complexity. When we say a quantum computation is easy or hard, we're talking about how many of those simple operations we have to put together to do the computation. And uh, I said physics is local, I meant it's much easier to act on a single atom or two atoms than uh, to act on many atoms at once. Now we're going to have to initialize our computer. Um, that is, we'll have to be able to set all our qubits to some standard initial state. Uh, and in particular, I would like that initial state to be a product state. Highly entangled states might in general be complex to prepare using our quantum platform but product states, not so much. I just have to set each one of the qubits to some standard value. Uh, by convention, I can say that I set each one of them to value zero. So like if I have n atoms in some laboratory device, I could initialize by setting each one of those atoms to the same microscopic state. Let's say everyone is in its ground state. That would be the all zero state. And so I'm taking it for granted in my definition of the computational model, that that's not such a hard thing to do in hardware. You can think of it as cooling, that we have to take, uh, generally, if you have a bunch of atoms, let's say in an ion trap or something like that, they're not all going to be in the ground state. They're going to have some distribution of an internal states. And to initialize, I'd like to cool them all down to withdraw entropy so they can, I can put all the atoms in, in a particular state, put the system of n atoms in a particular state. 
And um, I want to say that's not so hard to do in the lab. And, you know, it might be challenging in practice. I've got to optically pump the atoms or something like that. But uh, physicists have learned how to do those things. And because we're just preparing a product state, we'll take it to be something that's simple from the point of view of the computational model. Now we're going to have a set of universal gates like we did in the classical circuit model, but things are a little bit different now. Each one of the gates is going to be a unitary transformation. It's not enough to have unitary transformations that act on just one qubit because we couldn't build up entanglement that way. The product state would stay a product state. So in order to be able to access entangled states, we're going to have to have unitary transformations that act on at least two qubits at a time. But actually that is enough for universality. Um, what does it mean to be universal? It means that I can take gates in my universal gate set and by composing them together in a circuit, I can build up an approximation which is arbitrarily good to any unitary transformation of interest acting on the n qubits. Putting aside for the moment the question of how complex is it, how many gates do I need, universality means that in principle, if I put together enough gates, I can get as close as I want to any desired unitary in that two to the n dimensional Hilbert space. That's the analog of in the circuit model that we could uh, compute any Boolean function. There are lots and lots of them. So it typically is gonna take really big circuits to do it. But once we have a universal set of gates, that's enough to compute any uh, Boolean function. Or in the reversible model, we can get any permutation of the n-bit strings by putting together our universal gates like Toffoli gates in the, um, in the reversible model. Now, one thing you might wonder about is in the model, we usually assume that the set of, and this isn't really necessarily that essential, but we usually assume that we have a finite set of possible universal gates to choose from. And in fact, um, even acting on just a single qubit or two qubits, the, not, the unitaries form a continuum. So there are really an infinite number of possible unitaries. And you might've said, well, why can't I do any uh, single qubit unitary I want or any two qubit unitary I want? Why do I have to pick them from a finite alphabet? Uh, well, it's a good question. In the lab, uh, you might be able to uh, do essentially any single qubit unitary with about, about um, equal difficulty. But uh, the idea of specifying a finite instruction set, a finite number of possible gates is that uh, we have to somehow reconfigure our hardware if we want to do a different kind of gate. And we'd like to avoid doing that if we can. So we only want to have a finite number of hardware um, primitives that we need to call in order to build up our, uh, our unitary transformation of interest rather than selecting them from a continuum. Now this idea really becomes highly relevant when one gets to the issue of quantum error correction and fault tolerant quantum computing because as I think I've briefly mentioned in previous lectures, in fault tolerant quantum computing, when you're acting on encoded information protected by some quantum error correcting code, typically there really are just a discrete set of transformations that are easy to do, um, that preserve the code and perform some non-trivial logical operation on the code without exposing the encoded information to uh, damaging errors. And so there it really is important to stick with some a finite set of universal gates. And uh, we'll consider that to be part of our model. I'm gonna take it for granted that there's a classical computer in the wings that I'm going to use say to de de uh, design a quantum circuit. If I have some problem that I want to solve, I, I don't want to hide complexity in the difficulty of finding the circuit. We encountered the same issue in the classical model, remember? That's why I introduced this, at least informally, 
the idea of uniform circuit families. We want to use a similar idea in the, in the quantum model that it isn't computationally difficult to um, find the quantum circuit that solves a problem for any number of input bits um, rather than having to start from scratch every time you change the, the size of the input. So uh, if I really wanted to formalize that, I'd have to go beyond the circuit model and, and use something like a, a Turing machine model of computation, which, which I'd rather not talk about. But we're really not in worse shape in the quantum model than we are in the classical circuit model as far as that goes. And so I'm going to imagine, as I did in the classical circuit model, that the task of deciding what sequence of gates to perform to solve the problem has been farmed out to some classical computer. And we want that classical computer to be able to solve that part of the task efficiently in order for uh, us to say that a problem can be solved efficiently by the quantum computer. And um, in the end, the, is, let's say I'm trying to solve a decision problem or I'm trying to decide whether an input is in uh, a language or not in a language, I'm gonna have to output classical information. I don't want you to deliver to me some state of n qubits in some vast Hilbert space. I want bits. And that means for the final readout, we're going to wanna to measure in um, some basis. And I don't wanna hide complexity in the measurements that I perform. To perform a collective measurement on many qubits at once, that might be highly complex. I wanna do something that is physically reasonable, something that would be simple to do in hardware, like read out a single qubit in a standard basis. That's something that you know the physicists have learned how to do. Let's say it's an atom. It's either in its ground state or it's in uh, some particular excited state. You can interrogate the atom with a laser. And if it's in one state, it will stay dark. If it's in the other state, it will fluoresce and you can see it shining. And so it's pretty easy to read out an atom efficiently and, and pretty quickly. Um, and so uh, we're going to consider that to be part of the model that it's not difficult. It just sort of counts as a single step in the computation to read out a single qubit. Collective measurement on many qubits may co be complex, but uh, a measurement on a single qubit will be easy. So really we want to consider simple measurements at the end for the same reason that we want to consider simple initial states. We don't want to hide complexity in the preparation of that initial state or in the complexity of that, uh, that final measurement. So that's it. These are the steps in a quantum model of computation. I guess one remark I could make is that um, you might want to have the option of measuring a qubit and then conditioned on the outcome, deciding what um, operation to apply in the next step. In particular, if you wanted to simulate the randomized classical model, uh, you might want to do that um, because uh, you can simulate randomized computation using the quantum model if, say, you prepare a qubit in um, the state zero, and then you perform a gate which rotates it to an eigenstate of the poly operator x, like uh, a uniform superposition of zero and one, and then measure in the zero one basis, that'll generate a, um, that'll generate a random bit. Um, and you might want to consult randomness in the middle of the computation. But really, there's no loss of generality. Um, it, it is encompassed by the model I've described, uh, even if we do all the measurements at the end, because it's just a mathematical trick. I can model the uh, task of performing a computation uh, partway through, performing a measurement, and then doing further operations conditioned on the measurement. Uh, what I can imagine instead is that there's some quantum operation which is conditioned on the state of one of the qubits. And I don't read out that qubit until much later. But in the end, the effect on the final result will be the same as if I measured it midway through and then performed a conditional operation. So I'm just saying there's no loss of generality that we need to worry about if we delay all the measurements to the end.
as long as you're allowed to measure more than one qubit at the end, and I'm going to allow in the model for me to measure any subset of the qubits that I want, and including possibly all of them. Um, now, we think that, um, well, there's no question that a randomized classical computer can simulate this model. There isn't anything in this model that classical computers can't do. The gates are just matrices acting on vectors in a Hilbert space. And classical computers know how to multiply matrices and they know how to compute how matrices act on vectors. Uh, the issue is efficiency that the Hilbert space is so huge, it grows exponentially with the number of qubits. So the matrices we have to deal with have an exponential size in N and uh, you know the, uh, the number of qubits is going to scale like the size of the input to the problem. So as we scale up the input, we're going to have an exponentially growing Hilbert space. And that, as far as we know, though we don't know how to prove it from first principles, we don't know how to simulate what's going on without an exponential resource explosion either. We don't, as I'll discuss next time, we don't really need an exponentially large memory to store all these matrices, uh, but, um, or to, to store this vector in a huge Hilbert space. But if we don't store it, then uh, it's gonna cost us in terms of the time complexity of the algorithm. We're still going to need a very large number of gates to simulate what the quantum computer is doing uh, with the classical computer. So as far as what functions are computable in the Turing machine sense, um, the uh, story is not changed by quantum circuits as opposed to classical ones, or if you like quantum Turing machines as opposed to classical Turing machines, the conclusion about what functions are computable is the same, but the conclusion about what functions are efficiently computable with uniform circuit families of polynomial size, scaling polynomially with the input size, that, that we think um, is a different story with quantum circuits than with classical ones. Now, there's an analog to the class BPP, the randomized class, which we uh, talked about uh, not long ago, which is the quantum version, and it's called BQP, meaning bounded error quantum polynomial time. And BQP consists of the languages that can be decided by polynomial size uniform quantum circuit families, where these circuits are built out of the universal gates in the uh, quantum model. Um, and so essentially what they captures is the problems that you can efficiently solve with the quantum computer. That's what BQP means. It obviously contains BPP for the reason I said a minute ago, that within the quantum model, we can simulate random number generators. We can you know, prepare an eigenstate of poly operator X and then measure in the Z basis and the outcome will be a random bit. But we think BQP is bigger than BPP um, because we think quantum really does give us additional computational power. We hope it's larger, otherwise I'm really wasting your time with this class. We think quantum computers are more powerful than classical ones, even randomized classical ones, though we don't know how to, uh, how to prove it. Now, we can also define the quantum analog of MA. It's called QMA, or quantum Merlin Arthur. And it's pretty much the same story as MA, well, except for two differences. The verifier that Arthur uses to check the proof that Merlin provides is now a quantum circuit. So for a problem in QMA, we want it to be an efficient quantum circuit. So that's one way in which QMA goes beyond MA. But there's a second way. We allow the witness to be a quantum state. Merlin doesn't just send some classical bits to Arthur in QMA. 
he's allowed to send a quantum state. And Arthur can use that quantum state as part of the input to his efficient quantum computation for the purpose of verifying the proof. So if you like, a Merlin sends a classical proof in MA, which Arthur then verifies with his randomized classical computer. But in QMA, Merlin can send a quantum proof to Arthur and Arthur verifies it using his efficient quantum computer. So it's clear that QMA contains uh, MA, but um, we think it's larger, just as we think that BQP is larger than BPP, that the quantum model is more powerful than the classical model, even when it comes to verifying a proof. There's a kind of intermediate class we can also define, which is sometimes called QCMA, quantum classical Merlin Arthur. We can ask, what can we verify efficiently with a quantum computer if the witness is required to be classical? So Merlin in QCMA uh, sends a classical proof to Arthur and Arthur uses a quantum computer to somehow verify what, uh, what Merlin is saying. So this gives us a, a sequence of nested computational models. BPP is contained in BQP because BPP is the special case in which um, we uh, you know, just use the quantum model to generate randomness and the rest of the computation is classical. Um, and then BQP is contained in QCMA. Uh, BQP is just the special case um, in which um, the classical message sent by Merlin uh, isn't used. And QCMA is contained in QMA because in QMA, Merlin provides a quantum state as a witness, but he could send um, a quantum state, which is just some computational basis state. So in effect, he'd be sending classical information. So that's a special case of uh, a quantum witness would be a classical witness. So there are a lot of questions about the quantum model, which I want to uh, talk more about in the next couple of lectures. I haven't explained very precisely the idea of universal quantum gate sets. So I wanna say more about that and give you some examples of universal quantum gate sets, which will give us a better feel for what it means to have universality in the quantum setting. And um, there's a nuance which sort of goes beyond what we had to worry about in the classical circuit model because the unitary transformations actually form a continuum. I can't necessarily with any finite circuit exactly simulate one universal gate set with another in the quantum model. I can do it approximately. And so we're going to need to understand a little better what the cost is, how large a circuit you need to accurately simulate one set of universal quantum gates using another set of universal quantum gates. Another thing is that because the unitary transformations form a continuum, we may have an ideal model in which we have a finite alphabet of possible universal gates, and we can imagine building circuits out of those, but you'll never be able to capture that model precisely in hardware because we can't exactly hit any unitary transformation right on the nose, there will always be some small error. So we have to understand how large an error we can tolerate gate by gate in order to still get the right answer for a computation with some sufficiently high probability. If it turns out that we need some unreasonably accurate approximation to the ideal model with the gates we can realize in hardware, that would be bad news. Another thing we can do is we can ask, well, for a generic unitary transformation acting on n qubits, how large a quantum circuit do we really need? 
to get a good approximation to that unitary transformation. You remember we asked the analogous question about Boolean functions last time, and that's where we concluded that for most Boolean functions, you actually need an exponential size circuit in order to evaluate the function. Not surprisingly, there's a similar statement in the case of quantum computing for an arbitrary or generic unitary transformation acting on n qubits, acting on the vast two to the n dimensional Hilbert space of n qubits to get a good approximation to that unitary using the gates in our universal set, gates that act on just say two qubits at a time or a few qubits at a time, that's going to require an exponentially large circuit to get a good approximation. And it's really for the same reason that we discussed in the classical circuit case, that the, um, <coughs> in that case, the problem was that the, um, there were just so many Boolean functions that we needed to have many, many circuits to cover them all. <coughs> Excuse me. And in the quantum model, it's kind of a, ser a similar story. If you have n qubits, there's such a huge space of unitary transformations acting on the two to the n dimensional Hilbert space that to have a good approximation to them all is going to require uh, many, many circuits. Typically, we'll need circuits of exponential size to get close enough. So it's kind of a humbling thing. Uh, as in the case of classical computation, there are so many Boolean functions, but the ones that we'll ever be able to compute in uh, you know, the history of life in the universe is going to be a tiny, tiny fraction of all of them once, you know, n gets to be of modest size. And it's the same with quantum computing, that Hilbert space is incredibly vast. And for a pretty small number of qubits, you know, maybe just a few hundred, um, it's just inconceivable that we'll ever be able to explore more than a tiny, tiny, tiny little nook in the huge Hilbert space with computations that the quantum scientists and engineers will ever be able to realize even in their, in their wildest dreams. So there's a vast quantum world out there and the part that we can explore is just, um, just a tiny portion and the rest of it will always be essentially unknowable. All right, so see, these are some of the things that we're going to want to discuss in the next lecture and the one beyond. And then we'll be ready to, um, to talk about some applications and examples of quantum algorithms and the types of speed ups that we can realize relative to classical computing using quantum circuits. But I think that's going to be it for today. Uh, thanks for listening. Thanks for coming. And um, I'll be seeing you uh, again in a couple of days, I hope, uh, for more quantum fun. So be well and see you then. Bye-bye.